Good morning. It's great to see you all this morning. Welcome to Fifi Baptist Church. And as you saw in the video today, uh, we're kicking off our Annie Armstrong Easter offering, as is our tradition every year around the Easter time. And if you don't know about, much about Annie Armstrong, she's l- worth looking up. She's a really important figure in Baptist life. And it was kind of around the same time as Lottie Moon, Annie Armstrong was kind of the, the boots on the ground here in America. Uh, and uh, Lottie kind of didn't want us to name the offering after her, but Annie Armstrong did it anyway. And so, uh, yeah, we're, she's a big hero. So I definitely want to uh, pay attention to that offering. Uh, prior to coming to Missouri Baptist, I worked as a church planter down in South Florida. And uh, the Annie Armstrong offering did help support us too. And so one of the things we used the money for was to buy a baptistry because we were meeting at a high school. And so my job as one of the associates was to set up the baptistry and we baptize around 30 to 40 people a year. And that baptistry really, during the summer months we did it at the beach, but during the the winter months in Boca, we set that thing up and it's a a huge blessing. So yeah, I thank you in advance for your generosity to uh, the Annie Armstrong offering. Uh, Well, today we are continuing our Life and Teachings of Jesus series that we've been going through for several weeks. We kicked this off the first week of Advent, and my plan is to take this just a little bit past Easter. My original plan was to end this on Easter Sunday, and then I thought, well, he does a few things after he resurrects. (laughs) He shows up to people, he he ascends, he hangs out in heaven, he's doing what he's doing now. So uh, this week, as I was kind of praying through, thinking about what I'm going to preach on next, I thought, well, we'll just continue this just a few more weeks longer. So that's kind of the plan anyway for this Life and Teachings of Jesus series. Um, now, as we get started today, we're going to be talking about Jesus's teaching. And I want us to kind of open our minds, open that file in your head as we get ready to talk about what Jesus has for us today and think about busyness. Now, not business, busyness is what I'm talking about here. And I don't want to stress you out. You're at church. It's a Sunday morning. But take this as my permission to think for just a moment about how busy you are. Yeah, it's aggravating, isn't it? Most of us Americans kind of like being busy. And if you don't like busy, being busy, maybe you have a friend who's a friend kind of like I've got. I've got a buddy, we've been good friends since we were three years old, grew up in church together. We see each other about once a year now, which is kind of a guy thing. You have a buddy, which means you see each other once a decade. Uh, but I see him about once a year now. And every time I hang out with my buddy, you know the drill, you sit down, you're gonna have lunch, Like, hey man, how's it going? How have you been this past year since I saw you last? You can almost give me the answer for him already. Dude, I've been busy. It doesn't matter what time of year we meet, doesn't matter what's going on in this man's life, his answer to everything is, I've been busy. My buddy, this man is always busy, or at least that's what he tells me. Now confession time, I have to admit to you that I often give the same answer. Uh, Check my wife, you know, talk to my wife Andrea. I get home from work, she asks, how was your day? My answer is usually something like, it was busy, but good. Every now and then I mix it up and I'll say, it was good, but busy. Uh, That's how most of my answers are. And we love being busy. You know, I I did some research online and a guy named Adam Weitz writes in the Harvard Business Review. He says, quote, he says, once upon a time, leisure was a sign of prestige. Today, that idea has been turned on its head, busyness is the new status symbol, he says. And I think he's right. And he continues, he says, quote, busy people are considered important and impressive, and employees are rewarded for showing how hard they're working, end quote. Now look, even if we don't actually like being busy, whether we like it or not, many of us are still very busy. Now, I've even heard from retired people that will say that I'm busier now that I'm retired than I was before I retired. I think some of you have told me that. (laughs) And I think it's probably true. So why? Why are we so busy? Now, to be fair to ourselves, a lot of times we're busy for reasons that are good, for reasons that we simply can't avoid, right? We have to go to work to make money. We need money to feed the kids, to pay the mortgage, to keep the lights on in the house. You know, we have to work to take care of our children or our grandchildren. You might be the one watching your grandkids so your kids can go to work to make money to feed the kids and all the rest. You know, we have to mow the lawn. We have to take care of the garden. We have to maintain the house, clean the bathrooms, all the rest. You know, the car needs a safety inspection so you can renew the plates on your car. That's a legit example. My plates expire on my van at the end of this month. So that's on my literal to-do list for spring break. So a lot of times we're busy because of legitimate stuff that we have to do. And if we don't do this stuff, we're going to live in squalor or get pulled over for having expired plates. 
So much of our busyness, therefore, is stuff we can't avoid. You have to do a lot of this. But sometimes we're busy, or extra busy, because of a busyness that we create ourselves. Now, I don't necessarily mean a busyness from procrastination, although that's legit. You know, don't procrastinate, it'll eat you alive. I try to tell my students that on the regular. It only adds stress to procrastinate, just get it done. But what I mean here by busyness we create is more so that some of us take on more than we can handle as a way to find some value or some importance by taking on more and more stuff. Now, a lot of the stuff, like I mentioned earlier, is stuff you have to do. You got to work to make money. You got to maintain your car, your home, all the rest. Those aren't really optional. I guess it, can't, it is optional if you don't mind living in squalor. But for the most part, they're not optional. But sometimes we take on more, and that can stretch us too thin. Now, to be clear here, I'm preaching to myself as much as to any of you. You know, in addition to working full time at Missouri Baptist as a professor and preaching here on most Sundays. Uh, Right now, I'm writing a book. I'm writing a chapter in another book. I'm writing a couple lessons for another church for a small group curriculum. I'm speaking at a church at a conference later this month on the resurrection. I'm doing a Baptist history project for St. Louis Metro. I sell fences on the side for my dad. So to be clear, honestly, this message is literally as much to me as it is to any of you. I'm preaching to myself this morning. But today's message this morning is not really about teaching how to get everything done and therefore be less busy. You know, if you want to learn how to get everything done and be less busy, just go go on YouTube, find a TED Talk, or go find a book on time management, and you could do that. Actually, I'll save you the time. Here's what you need to do. Write a to-do list, stick to your to-do list, mark things off when you're done. It feels really good. Do the hard thing first in the day. It's called eating the frog. You know, if if you have to eat a frog sometime in the day, eat that thing for breakfast rather than saving it for supper, because if you have to eat the frog at supper, you're going to think about it all day long. So eat that frog, get it out of the way, then move on to the stuff you actually like. And then when you have downtime, do the little piddly stuff and get off social media. That's how you do it. That's how you get everything done. That's how I get everything done. But that's not what I'm concerned about today. What I'm concerned about today is not really tips on how to get everything done, It's more than I'm interested in what Jesus wants to teach us this morning about what it means that we are so busy. You know, Jesus isn't concerned about how to get everything done. He's more concerned about where do we find our identity? Do we find our identity, our value, our worth in being busy? Or do we find it in our relationship with him? And so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me. The words will be on the screen as usual too. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. And as we look at Matthew 11, 28 through 30 to kick off this morning, we're going to see how Jesus is trying to show us that we need to find our, our identity, our rest, not in what we're doing, but in him. So take a look. Matthew 11, starting in verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus invites us, and he calls us, we who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, that is, we who are so busy to find our rest in him. And he tells us here that his yoke is easy. Now, unless if you've plowed a field recently, you may not know exactly what a yoke is. Now, a yoke is not the same thing as an egg yolk. That's actually spelled with an L, different type of thing. The yoke here that he's talking about is like a, a bar, like a piece of wood you'd put across the back of an animal, like an ox or a horse, and you'd tie that around their neck, and then they would use that thing to pull like a plow or pull a heavy wagon or something like that. Now, if you're very poor, you do that yourself. You yourself become the one who does the the plowing with the yoke on your own back. Now, a heavy yoke would mean that you're carrying some pretty heavy stuff. Say you're plowing a rocky field, or like here in St. Louis, you're plowing a field that has a whole lot of clay in it, very difficult to dig through. I used to put up fence, I know all about it. Uh, Very tough ground around this part. Or Wildwood, it's all rock. Don't put up a fence in Wildwood. Um, (laughs) It's the worst. Imperial's just as bad. Um, Or you have like a, a wagon that's weighed down with a lot of stuff. That's a heavy yoke. But Jesus tells us that his yoke is easy, which means that Jesus isn't asking us to do harder work. 
He's, Jesus is not asking you as a Christian to work harder. He's telling you to take a rest. It's okay to rest. His yoke is easy. He's not saying you have to plow the, the hardest field. And this rest that Jesus offers us, I think, is rest from busyness, yeah, but I think it's even more than just that. You know, a moment ago, we talked about how busy we are, and some of this busyness is necessary. But I think that concerning busyness, which I think is what Jesus is addressing here, is that busyness that we kind of create to make ourselves feel valuable. You know, it's the busyness that allows us to tell everyone, like my buddy and I tell each other once a year, man, I've been busy. I've been so busy this year, which is code word for I'm a really important person. I'm very valuable. People need me. The world will fall apart if I weren't so busy. That's what we mean by I've been so busy this year. It's a busyness that, as the guy from Harvard Business Review said earlier, it's a status symbol. And I think Jesus is calling us to give up that type of busyness. He's, he's in inviting us to abandon that kind of busyness today, to find our rest in him, find our identity, your purpose, your importance, and your status in him, and not actually in how busy you are. So I don't actually think these verses, funny enough, are about working less. I think they're actually about where we find our identity, no matter how much you're actually working. And how do I know that? How do I know that this isn't about working less how do I know that the rest that Jesus promises isn't necessarily freedom from work, but more of a change in how you understand identity? Well, I think the clue is the next two stories that come after this in Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. Now, we often miss this connection between 11, 28 through 30 and 12, 1 through 14, and we miss it usually because there's a chapter break here. And we typically read chapter by chapter, which is a good thing. Uh, many of you are probably doing the, the reading through the Gospels thing with Gloria right now, where you're reading a chapter at a time. If you're not, jump on it. It's a great idea. Read the Gospels chapter by chapter. Do it. But sometimes we miss some connections because we read a chapter and we go to bed and read the next chapter the next day and forget about what we just read. And many of you probably know that the chapter divisions in the Bible were added later. They're not, like, they're not inspired. So when the author of Matthew wrote Matthew, he didn't write like chapter 11, as a heading, and then write a bunch of stuff. Chapter 12, write a bunch of stuff. The chapter divisions were added in the 1200s by a couple of Catholic cardinals, not the baseball players, the church guys. Uh, they added those later. And the verses don't show up until the 1500s. So for 1200 years, the church was operating with the scripture without any chapter divisions at all. So the chapter divisions, the verse divisions are not inspired by God. The words are, but not the way we divide up the words. And so what we have in Matthew 12, 1 through 14, right after the verses we just read about the yoke being easy, are two stories to illustrate what Jesus means by that. What he means by saying to take a rest and that his yoke is easy. And funny enough, these two stories we're going to see are not about working less. They're more about where do you find your identity? Where do you find your purpose? And we'll see that this identity is not actually found in working harder or working less. It's not about following the rules even. It's about finding our identity, our value, not in anything we do or don't do, but in the mercy of God. So continuing into chapter 12, we'll start with the first story, Matthew 1, pardon me, Matthew 12, we'll start in verse 1. It reads, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. Now, just to kind of defend the disciples here, they're not technically stealing according to the Old Testament law. Deuteronomy 23, 25 says that you can pluck heads of grain. Uh, you just can't chop down the whole plant. But if you need a little snack, you're going through someone's field, you're allowed to take a little bit. Just don't cut down the whole thing. So the issue that the Pharisees are going to have here in a second isn't with theft or with stealing. It's the fact that they're doing it on the Sabbath. If you look at verse 2, when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, as I read through Scripture, a lot of times, like, these questions jump out at me. Maybe it's my own, you know, kind of creativity or whatever. But I'm thinking, like, these Pharisees, do they wear, like, these long priestly robes and all the rest? Like, what are these dudes doing hanging out in the field on a Sabbath? Like, you know, what are you doing? You've already said you can't pluck heads of grain, so what are you doing out there? Are you trying to get a suntan or what? What are you doing out there? Well, I think we know they're probably out there because they're wanting to catch the disciples doing something wrong. 
So they're out there kind of like as spies looking to point out something that they're doing wrong, and they found it. Your disciples, Jesus, are picking grain on the Sabbath, which is not lawful to do. Now, to be clear, very clear, to the Pharisees' credit, God does indeed make it very clear that he does not want his people working on the Sabbath. And he's not messing around. Look at uh, Exodus 31, 13 through 15. God says, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between you, me and you throughout your generations, given in order that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Like I said, God ain't messing around. He really wants you to rest on the Sabbath. Whoever does, not, does any work shall be cut off from among the people. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day, a Sabbath of, holy, of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Then he says it again. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath shall be put to death. So like I said, God is not messing around when it comes to the Sabbath. He wants his people to take a day off. Now, this feels kind of extreme. Why would God go to this extreme saying, you deserve death if you work on the Sabbath? Well, if you kind of think about the historical context, it makes a little bit of sense. Remember, God gives the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, kind of placing in, this, in the historical story. They're in Mount Sinai because they're in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness because they just crossed the Red Sea. They just crossed the Red Sea because they were running away from Egypt's army. They're running away from Egypt's army because they were slaves in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt for 430 years. So for 430 years, God's people Israel never got a day off. God finally delivers them from slavery. He's like, hey, look, y'all, none of my people are going to work seven days a week no more. You need to take a day off. And I'm taking this ser so seriously that I'm willing to in institute the death penalty for anyone who makes someone work seven days a week. So this is how serious God is saying, my people are free from slavery. Don't put your, my people in slavery again. So the Sabbath, therefore, if you look at it in this context, is more of a gift than it is a rule. The Sabbath is God's way of requiring us to rest, not because of a legalistic thing, but because God wants to bless us with the gift of rest. And you know as well as I know that a gift of rest takes faith. You know, no one else in the ancient world was taking a day off an entire day a week. You know, a lot of people thought the Jewish people were crazy. Like, you mean you're, you're taking an entire day off where you're not working your fields? There's a lot of faith that that, that takes. I imagine that several ancient Israelites probably thought something like, you know, if I could just work this one Sabbath, I could get so much more work done. Could you just imagine, maybe I'll just cheat this one, this one Saturday and I could get so much more done. But that's the whole point. It ain't about what you can get done. It's about trusting God to supply your needs. And just as an aside, this, if you aren't taking a Sabbath right now, I'd urge you to start doing that. I don't think the death penalty applies anymore for it. But accept this as the gift that God is trying to give you. Don't look at it from a legalistic angle, but I'm just saying that God didn't design any of us to work constantly. We're not built to work all the time. So take a rest. And this, as a professor, this is why I make all my assignments due on Saturday night. I tell my students this sometimes, but the whole point is I don't want them cramming to get everything done on Sunday. I want them to rest on Sunday. I want them to go to church. And I want them to play video games in the afternoon or take a walk or do something. Just don't do homework on Sundays. That's why I make everything due on Saturdays. So anyway, as we've seen, God gives Israel and gives us the Sabbath, not as a bunch of rules, but as a gift. It's the gift of rest. But the Pharisees are taking things a bit too far. They're missing this whole point of the giftiness, the gift that is the Sabbath. And they're starting to take the Sabbath less as a gift and more as a rule. It's a rule to follow, not so much a gift to enjoy. And when, a, when your rest becomes a rule, it's no longer restful. It becomes stressful. So you're so freaked out about, am I resting hard enough? And if you're worried about resting hard enough, then you're not resting at all. So we see Jesus' response to the Pharisees next, verses uh, 3 and 4. He tells them, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests. Now, we're not going to look at this story in detail, but it shows up in, uh, at the beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 21, if you want to go and read it. And he asked the Pharisees, Have you not read... 
Now, this probably hurt their feelings. You know, the Pharisees are experts in the law. Like, have you not read? Like, you came up to me and like, have you not read the book of Hebrews? Like, dude, I wrote an entire book on the book of Hebrews. Yeah, I've read the book of Hebrews. That might hurt my feelings a little bit. But that's what he goes and does to the Pharisees. Have you not read? Like, yeah, dude, that's like our whole thing. Yeah, we've, we've read it. So yeah, they're experts in the law, but have they read it? Yeah, but did, did they understand it? Well, apparently not. So Jesus gives them another example. And he does it, it, does it again. Or have you not read? Doggone, he's doing it again. Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are guiltless? So, you know, priests, they work all the time on the Sabbath. It's okay for them. Why can they work on the Sabbath? Well, why? Because they're doing God's business. They're doing what God called them to do on the Sabbath. That's kind of their thing. And a lot of pastors, you know, they'll take a day off during the week and they'll take Monday off or Friday off, something like that, because they're kind of like the priest working on the Sabbath. You know, Sunday's a day of work, so they take off another day during the week. That's a, a good idea, I think. And look at what Jesus says next, verse six. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. So the priests are working in the temple on the Sabbath. They're doing what God called them to do. And that's a really big deal. They should be doing that. And he's saying, look, the disciples are right in the middle of God's will right now. Now, they're not working in the temple. That's a big deal. That's special. That's important. But now they're hanging out with the God himself. The priests are working in God's house. Big deal. No one's saying that's not a big deal. But the disciples are hanging out with the dude who lives there. So how much bigger of a deal is that? So in other words, cut the disciples some slack. And then Jesus brings the hammer in the next two verses, seven and eight. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This, uh, this quote here, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, is a quote from, Hose- from the book of Hosea, chapter six, verse six. And this is actually the second time that Matthew quotes this verse. Matthew quotes it twice. The other gospels don't quote it at all. The previous time he quotes it is in Matthew chapter 9, after the Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples why he hangs out with tax collectors and sinners. So look at that. It's Matthew 9, 12 through 13 on the screen. It says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. So he tells them in Matthew 9, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Apparently between chapter 9 and chapter 12, they haven't learned it yet. So he doubles down on it in verse 12, or chapter 12. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The Pharisees are picking on people again for not meeting their standard that they set up. And so Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6 6 to them again. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now, to be clear, God totally wanted sacrifice. Not so much anymore. Jesus is the final sacrifice. Go read Hebrews chapter 10. We don't need to make sacrifices anymore. Jesus has done that for us. But Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet at this point. So God is totally on team sacrifice. Go read the book of Leviticus. But God just doesn't want sacrifices at the cost of mercy. The Pharisees were so convinced that following the rules is where they find their identity, that they forgot to show mercy. And Jesus calls them out on this later in Matthew chapter 23. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin. Those are all good things. But you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. What are those? Justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others, You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. So Jesus doesn't mind the Pharisees keeping the Sabbath. He actually wants them to keep the Sabbath. That's the whole point. But they need to show mercy first. Mercy triumphs over obedience, triumphs over sacrifice. So this then is where we find our rest. Our rest is not actually in doing less. If our rest becomes a rule, like I said earlier, it's not restful anymore. Our minds are going to be just as cluttered as they were before, but now with the the concern about, am I resting well enough? It's a backwards form of busyness all over again. Real rest comes when we give up our efforts to make God happy by what we're doing. Real rest comes when we realize that God wants a relationship with us, that God is happy with us because of Jesus, 
not because of anything we do or don't do. It's because of his love for us. And he wants us to just enjoy God's love, enjoy the rest by showing mercy to others. Now, to be fair to the Pharisees, before we're too hard on them, I think we can admit that we can be like them sometimes too, can't we? You know, Jesus told us that he came to offer us rest for our souls, but sometimes, at least I, maybe you too, feel like if we just work a little bit harder, if we follow a set of rules, we can earn even more of God's favor. God will be even happier with us if we just do this extra thing or two. If I work a little bit harder, maybe God will be even happier with me than he was before. You know, if I take on this extra service project, if I take on this extra course, if I write this extra thing, if I serve this extra Sunday, if I fill in the blank, then God will be happy with me, extra happy with me. Extra work equals extra love. The busier I am for God's kingdom, the happier God will be with me. But look, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus tells us to rest He tells us to find our identity not in what we do, but in what Jesus has already done. Now, sometimes this treatment that we have toward ourselves, this like, got to work harder, got to work harder, that can turn outward, and we can start to direct that toward other people. You know, sometimes we show others with our words or our actions that they need to work harder, they need to live up to a certain standard to earn God's love. That's what the Pharisees are doing to the disciples, You know, if they'd only done this and that, then God would have accepted them. Now listen, to be clear, God wants our obedience. No question about that. If you ever have a pastor telling you, you don't have to obey God, go to a different church. God wants you to obey, no question. But he wants our justice and our mercy and our faith even more than he wants our obedience. And he does want our obedience. Just shows how much he wants the others. We find our rest not in what we do, but in resting in what God has already done for us. Because look, Jesus this morning right now already loves you to the max. There is no way Jesus could love you more tomorrow than he loves you today. Jesus loves you at the maximum level. That means there's nothing you can do. There's no amount of busy that you can make yourself, even busy in good things, God honoring things to make God love you more. God already loves you to the max more than I can explain to you more than any of us, myself included, can really understand. That's how much God loves you. And so you see, it's not even about doing less. It's about resting in God's love and then showing mercy to others. So this then is how the first story, after Jesus' famous words about his yoke being easy that we read at the end of chapter 11, this is how this first story connects to that. How does Jesus give us rest? Well, funny funny enough, it's not about resting from working, per se. You know, the disciples worked on the Sabbath. They pricked in heads of grain. So that's not the issue. The priests have to work on the Sabbath in the temple. So the issue isn't work. It's where do we find our value, our identity? Do we find that in keeping a bunch of rules? Do we find it in being busy? Is that how we find our importance? Or do we find it in our relationship with Jesus? who calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath? Are we showing mercy both to ourselves and other people, or are we just busy? Then Jesus shows us what this mercy should look like in the next story. If you still have your Bibles, you'll see it in Matthew 12, verses 9 through 14. We'll start in the first two verses. It reads, He left that place and entered their synagogue. A man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, Is it lawful to cure on the Sabbath? so that they might accuse him. So the Pharisees come to Jesus and ask, is it lawful to cure, to heal on the Sabbath? Now, this was actually a matter of debate among the rabbis. You know, all the rabbis agreed that you should do something to save someone's life on the Sabbath. But if it's like a minor thing, should you do this on the Sabbath or not? That was, like a, that was a, an ongoing debate among uh, the people. So they bring this to Jesus. This guy has a withered hand. Are you going to heal this guy or not? Now, this is not presumably a life-threatening thing. Presumably, this man had had a withered hand for most or even all of his life. We don't really know. So the question is, Jesus, are you going to do this on the Sabbath or are you going to wait until tomorrow? Which for tomorrow for them is sundown. Are you going to wait until sundown to heal him? Or are you going to do it now? And Jesus gives his answer in the next few verses. He says, suppose one of you had only one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath. Would you not lay hold of it and lift it out? 
How much more valuable is a human being than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then they said to the man, stretch out your, or then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it was, and it was restored as sound as the other. Now a sheep that falls into a pit is presumably not necessarily immediately in a life or death situation. You know, the Sabbath, like I said, it ends at sundown. Let's say you're a shepherd. Your sheep falls into the, the pit at like, I don't know, three o'clock on uh, the Sabbath in the afternoon. You know, I presume you could hang out with the sheep for a few hours until the sun goes down, then rescue him. You know, so I don't think it's like a life or death thing that he's talking about with the sheep. But Jesus says that even then, most people would rescue the sheep on the Sabbath if it falls into a pit. This man with the withered hand is kind of like that sheep in a pit. Yeah, sure, I'm imag- I imagine Jesus could have waited until sundown to heal the guy, but he's going to heal him now because a human being is much more valuable than a sheep. So Jesus is showing us what it looks like to show mercy over sacrifice. Jesus is much more concerned about the well-being of his neighbor than following a set of rules just perfectly. Mercy triumphs over sacrifice. And then see the reaction in verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him, how to destroy him. Mark and Luke said this, say the same thing. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this miracle is what makes the Pharisees want to go out and kill Jesus. That's like the first time in the Gospels, they're like, we've got to go kill this guy. It's after this. And it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Like, it's like darkly funny to me that Jesus just heals a guy, brings life to a guy. He gets in trouble for working on the Sabbath. But apparently, like, conspiring to kill a man on the Sabbath is not bad. You know, it's kind of weird. Uh, But that's kind of the trap of legalism, right? The trap of legalism is that we have this double standard where we hold people to a higher standard than we hold to ourselves. And that's what's going on here, I think. Very few people can live up to the standards they set for other people. So let's return to Jesus' words that we opened up with this morning. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So friends, my prayer for you this morning, and honestly my prayer for myself this morning, is that you will find your rest in Jesus. Your value is not in what you do. It's not in how much you do. It's not even how much you don't do. It's not about your busyness one way or the other. It's about Jesus' love and Jesus' mercy. So I'd like to close with the words of Hosea. We mentioned earlier, Hosea quoted Hosea 6.6 in Matthew 12.7. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. But Hosea 6 opens with a beautiful call to repentance and to restoration. I think that's going to make for a fitting close to today's message. So hear the word of the Lord, Hosea 6, 1 through 3, as we wrap up. Come. Let us return to the Lord, for it is he who has torn and he will heal us. He has struck down and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up so that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His appearing appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like showers, like the spring rains that water the earth.